much for joining Book Club today. Don't forget to like and subscribe and get ready to hear from some doulas who knows why. All right. So do we want to start on chapter 11? Sure. All right. So the, the first sentence here is like the most thing, important thing to remember that the only necessary techniques for inducing lactation are frequent and effective breast stimulation and milk removal. It's like, you don't need to have medication. It can help, but you do not need to, to do that. Um, and how, yeah, just when you start might affect how much you're able to make right away. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, removal by a baby or a good pump uh, is going to be your your best. But I mean, like it has a whole lot. Um, the breastfeeding, pumping, hand expression, breast massage, nipple manipulation, and partner stimulation. <laughs> There it is. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> just like manipulating the, the, the first stage is just manipulating the breast. Mm -hmm. and, and then once there's actually milk, we're moving it. Right. <laughs> Chris and I'm just you imagining going to my husband and being like, hey, I need you to help me produce milk and him just being like, no, <laughs> no, absolutely not. Thanks for the offer though. No. You know, um, a few years ago, I read an article about how like breast milk was a trending, um, like, uh, supplement among men for like, like as an exercise, um, drink, <laughs> to to help replenish those electrolytes and <laughs> I mean yeah it makes sense breast milk is amazing like but there's there's absolutely no way that my husband would be chill with that zero percent chance <laughs> I, I would never um I feel like my husband would make it into a game and then I would never want him to participate ever again. <laughs> yeah. I could see that. <laughs> I liked that it actually described um, breast compression instead of just saying to do it and actually giving the steps on 155. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I love, it went into a lot of detail on how to do, um, several things like, um, the app breast supplementer, the different, like, yeah, the different ways. I don't know if, um, that might've been later on, like kind of the different ways that you can supplement, um, just mm -hmm. like self instructions was nice. Um, I love the, um, the side on breast storage capacity, because I don't think that that's ever, a lot of people don't really understand that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, it, it's talked about less than just like the overall overarching, like milk supply, which like, right. Uh, how much you produce per a 24 hours is going to be way more important than how much you produce like per a milk removal mm -hmm. um, and how that is not related to breast size at all um it, different women will be able to um just produce and like hold uh different mm -hmm. amounts of milk at a time so it's like some women can go long longer periods of time between milk removal uh and it not cause a lot of discomfort or um not cause a huge drop in how much they're able to um 
output over the entire day, but some may need to remove milk more frequently um, in order to get that that full amount over the same period of time. Uh, yeah. Stop <laughs> uh, being produced if it's if they go too long. That was one of my questions. Um, if you have a higher storage capacity and therefore your child is removing more milk like in the feed and feeding less frequently. I mean, the idea for what I've been told is removing milk more frequently and like an empty breast is the one that's making milk. Is it still kind of considered an empty breast if the capacity is not completely full, but you're not breastfeeding as often? So the thing with the breast milk capacity is, um, I, d I don't remember the name of the um, lactation consultant that dubbed the term, but um, there's sort of like a magic number um, philosophy for, for breastfeeding of each woman, like it's based off of breast of, of their breast milk capacity. Um, but like, there's a certain number of times that you have to remove milk during the day for your supply to be adequate for your baby. And, um, some, in some cases that's going to be less than others, like a very small storage capacity. Um, you're, if you can only like hold, uh, store it, that's, it's kind of hard to explain because you don't really store milk, um, like that, but, uh, there is a certain amount that, that you can go before your, your milk production starts like slowing down. Um, and if you have a smaller storage capacity, that amount's going to be much smaller. So you need to remove milk more frequently so that you can continue to produce that milk. If it's large, your baby may not even be like emptying the breast each time. And that's like when you might have oversupply issues too, your supply will eventually regulate, but you still, um, you could hold a lot more milk before your supply like drops a ton. Um, the emptier the breast, the faster milk is produced. Um, but uh, you don't. So like if you have a larger store capacity, if you are going to, if you are emptying the breast very um, frequently, it's not like it's. Uh, you, uh, I would say if you're nursing very frequently, it's probably less likely that you're actually emptying the breast if you have a very large capacity and you're have a large supply. Um, you could go longer periods of time and then your baby will eat more and drink mm -hmm. more of that. Um, and that's all part of just like uh, reading your baby and reading your body of how often does baby want to eat. Uh, that's going to be your best gauge uh, is re is going to be reading the baby or like if you're feeling very engorged, you should get uh, try and get some relief. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't, don't let um, a full breast stay full for a very, very long. Um, right. You don't want clogged ducts and mastitis and all that, those fun complications of uh, producing milk. <laughs> no. I don't know. Did I explain that well at all? Because I feel like I rambled a bit. You did not. I not ramble. <laughs> you explained it well. You did not ramble. Um, I feel like I my question was answered and I understand it better. That's always been it's I think that it is difficult to explain because it sounds like you're saying opposite things, but you're not. And especially because it's going to depend on when you're calling it storage capacity, but then you're saying, well, you're not actually storing milk that I could see be extremely confusing to people. I remember that being really confusing for me. I always assumed that I was going to have a large production because I have a large chest. And so I thought, 
there's plenty of space in there to store a lot of milk. I don't know the difference, right? I'm like this cute little 23 year old baby that was having babies and didn't know. I uh, wasn't really raised around breastfeeding. So that was just a complete assumption that I made on my part. And then when my production was low, I was very confused. But I was like, got the equipment, you know, what's going on here? And I didn't really understand that difference. And I thought that it was a lot of storing of milk. And, you know, and it does call it storing capacity in here. So I could see where that terminology just on its own is going to be really confusing for people and would be difficult to kind of explain to someone, well, you're not actually storing milk and the mechanics of it. I think that yeah. having some different terms would be helpful, but that's not your fault. <laughs> yeah, I feel like when we're talking to moms, um, we don't necessarily need to get too detailed in, in some of the mechanics um, because it, um, the terminology is very confusing. Um, it's like you're not like storing milk like it's like bags of milk in your breasts um, right. <laughs> um it, it's what you still literally call them most I would literally I refer to my boobs as my milk bags because I legit did not understand how it worked <laughs> yeah but um I I like the the magic number terminology a little bit better than um, the, like the storage capacity, uh, just kind of because of that, it kind of, um, the storage capacity kind of gives you a, the wrong idea of what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. but it's like, you should remove milk often because, uh, the more often it's removed, the faster your body's going to make milk, but like not everyone needs to remove it as frequently as others do. Um, mm -hmm. and it has nothing to do with, um, breast size, uh, and Oops. yeah, and it changes with every baby, every, every time you lactate, it changes. Like, I mean, with my first baby, my, uh, I had to feed him every hour and a half, um, for him to get enough calories throughout the day my third mm -hmm. one he was happy to go four hours between feedings um and he got plenty chunky <laughs> you chunk <laughs> you big boy <laughs> i wonder if there's something to that because with each pregnancy you would be developing more of that tissue yeah and so your storage capacity would go up Usually it, it would, because like you are every single time you lactate, you are creating more um, milk making tissue. Um, and really a lot of it too is like, you're not just creating a more tissue. You're also creating more like receptors for relax prolactin. Um, mm. So it more easily responds to your hormonal changes to produce milk. Um so that's part of like, for the most part with each baby, it becomes easier and easier to produce milk and you produce more of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From like your body perspective, which yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that the baby is going to be as apt at removal or not have some other form of, um, you know, process that needs to be worked through to help them, but that your capacity should increase unless there's some other unless there's um, like a mitigating I mean, factor yeah it is a dyad so it's not just each new baby needs to learn how to breastfeed they right. they, they have their their instincts and things but they still um they haven't done it before <laughs> even though right. you have they have not um mm -hmm. so it and anatomy, like how you, how you both fit together, um, can affect things too. So like maybe your like first baby could be really big. And the next one is like, maybe they were preterm even like you have your own, um, there's just like unique challenges with 
everything. Um, and then oversupply can always creep in and throw, throw everything off. Um, it's a, a tends to be more common of an issue than an un, undersupply. Um, but. So if a person is relactating, like for example, if I was choosing to relactate, I haven't breastfed in five years, I meet the criteria, it would be, oh no, I forgot the term. There's a difference. Inducing so lactation. Thank you. I would be inducing lactation, not relactating. So is the difference there that my body doesn't necessarily keep those receptors because it's been five years and they're like, I don't need that anymore. So like if I were to adopt, for example, and wanted to relactate or if I just wanted to help provide um, you know, for like the formula shortage or something. And I just was like, you know what, I'm just going to start doing this and bring it to a milk bank. Um, would I have lost some of that storage capacity in that time? Uh, yeah. So it's, you're still going to have an easier time than if you had never lactated. Um, if you had never been, um, pregnant, I, uh, then, then it would be a little bit harder. But like the process of weaning uh, during that stage of lactation, you're, it kind of like shuts down those, um, that milk making tissue because uh, it's not needed anymore. Uh, right. And that's how you get to where you're not like engorged constantly because you're not breastfeeding a baby. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, it'll be easier, but you may not get to the like supply that you may have had um, when you lactated before. But again, oh it's God. motivation. Yes. I am so tempted to experiment just so that I, because I have zero experience with this. And so now that I'm like learning about it, I'm like, hmm. Maybe just literally to learn and to go through it myself and to have, and then part of me is like, man, that's a commitment. <laughs> like just, just to be able to relate to your clients better, you're going to try and experience this yourself. I, you know, I think that, I might. Sounds like I you. Think, <laughs> that's like and for the podcast, I'll give updates. How you yeah. doing? I got two ounces today. Say so I am currently in uh, stage one of my uh, in uh, lactation inducing journey. <laughs> These are the uh, hormonal effects that I'm experiencing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not going to do one of the pregnancy podcasts that you and Brittany did, so maybe I'll do a an induct. In what? Why can I not? I can't do it if I can't even remember the terms. Inducing lactation journey. Just be like, I'm making milk again. <laughs> Dustin will have fun making those graphics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Off topic. Tangent. I did it again. Yeah. So, um, goodness. Where are we going from, from here? So I know I asked a ton of questions that were not necessarily, but it's the stuff that came up in my mind as I was reading yeah. that is not answered in this book. Um, and I, I feel like, like, I love the, the detail in this. I love the step-by-step -step procedures in this, which is going to be somebody who is picking up this book. They're going to need step-by-step -step procedures you yeah. know, just to go, even get a basic understanding of, of what they might be getting ready to go through. Um, and I really like the stories. I think that that's going to be really helpful for setting expectations. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of this part is like, it's just so prescriptive. So it's like, mm -hmm. I love that you have questions <laughs> without like, just like, 
otherwise I'm like, I'm just going to read. <laughs> so. <laughs> we're just going to go through and you're like, and now on page 162, we're going to go over hand expression, which we should get out one of your foods and start talking about. Yes. That was like exactly why I was like, what, what, what was get I right. demonstrating again? <laughs> hand expression, because it is so, okay. It is so hard to find decent advice on hand expression. Um, and I, I do not understand why I had like this favorite video that I used to share and it got taken off of YouTube and it took me forever to find good. And it's not that difficult to explain. I don't understand why. Go for it. All right. So with hand expression, we're being gentle. We're not. So here, here's my boob. Um, so you're you're kind of like you start out kind of waking the breast up kind of gentle um massage you're trying to let it know that it's ready it's time to make milk um mm -hmm. you don't want to be like pulling on nipple like you're a cow or like trying to mimic a pump um when you're hand expressing that's not that's just going to um, cause pain. Right. Generally. And so like, once you have the breast warmed up, you're going to want to be pushing probably like, uh, an inch, inch and a half or so outside of the nipple. Um, you don't really want to go necessarily by where your areola is because that varies so much. Um, but you're be, want to position your fingers a little bit away from the nipple and you're, pushing down to um to then get the the milk to be expressing and you're not going to be pushing hard this is a this is glandular tissue you don't want to cause damage um it's just going to be a very gentle process of and then you'll move your you'll want to move your fingers around to get um milk flowing from all of the ducts you don't really uh you don't want to just empty part of the breast uh you can if you're uh producing mature milk with if you're inducing lactation then you're going to start out with um mature milk you're not going to kind of go through that uh colostrum phase so you can just use like which I don't have, uh, use anything to collect it, really, a, a cup or a bottle. Um, if you were trying to do hand, hand express colostrum and, or like even if it's just going to be a really small amount, a spoon is a perfect receptacle. Uh, and then you can like you, if you only get like drops, you can use like a syringe to kind of like suck it in and store. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, you'll want to. It, it's just be gentle. Don't don't tug. Um, do some massage beforehand to kind of wake things up. You can even do a kind of like jiggle. Kind of helps to get things moving. <laughs> and you could have one breast that has <laughs> nipple protruding and one that's inverted too <laughs> um mm -hmm. so yeah don't don't focus too much on the nipple it's all the breast tissue um what other and then like some of that kind of like the waking the just like breast manipulation that's um what it's suggesting for kind of helping with um, that first stage of, of developing the breast tissue, um, you're waking things up and just uh, a lot of manipulation, a lot of gentle massage. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I always like to let my clients know that you are going to have milk sometimes even all the way up into your armpit 
That's where I kept a lot of mine, which was so confusing to me why my body chose to shove all my milk up into my armpits. There's plenty of other space, but whatever. And so that manipulation that you do can go all the way up Mm -hmm. and very gentle. And there is a, I was taught to be rough. You don't need to be, it doesn't cause you to, to have any more come out. Um, I can understand where you might kind of make that connection because that's what I did where I thought, oh, the more like that I manhandle it, the more that I'm pushing this out, you know, Um, but you don't have to do that. It's all very gentle and do the whole breast because you've got milk all over the place and just moving downward, kind of thinking about it in the same as like if you're doing a really gentle massage to increase your uh, blood flow, like your hands or your feet. Um, just really nice, gentle downward motions. Yeah. So like, yeah, whenever you're trying to express milk, you're doing that massage that like goes like starting in the armpits and then down towards the nipple, um, moving, you can just do like simple finger movements like this, just like gentle. Um, if you, um, for things like engorgement, uh, you'd actually do like the opposite and do like a lymph massage where you're massaging away from the nipple and towards the armpits. So it's like mm-hmm. you do different types of breast massage that you may use for different situations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. After hand expression, I always like to do the like engorgement procedure anyway. Just I have absolutely no idea if I made any difference, but it felt good. So just get everything nice and moving. <laughs> Well, I mean, that could be like very beneficial if you were um, like prone to mastitis or have a oversupply and and such because like that that lymph movement is just like really really important and like if that's like that's part of why engorgement it becomes a problem. It's like, it's just a ton of inflammation and um, fluids aren't able to move properly. And that's, and so like those, lim- the lymph massage and removing, I mean, removing um, breast milk uh, in a timely fashion uh, keeps mm-hmm. everything, keeps that, that inflammation down. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> all right uh anything else for chapter 10 Mm-mm. uh more charts which made me happy yeah, I, don't, I didn't have a bunch of talking points for for all of these um it kind of repeats mm-hmm. um which is not necessarily a bad thing um you know sometimes when you're explaining things to people presenting the information in several different ways is going to be really important to reaching different learning types um and so i i kind of liked that it was like in this chapter we're introducing this information in this chapter we're going more in depth and in this chapter we're putting it in chart form so all right uh uh chapter 12 is about medications this is where i'm like and this is completely outside of my scope <laughs> yes uh very 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 far out of the scope of a doula but uh, I, to to <laughs> I mean being able to um just know what options are available um Mm -hmm. it's like the these are things that um some people find useful um for you to go and talk to your care provider about um yeah so um i mean we've already talked about some of this but uh Mm -hmm. that I like it kind of goes into some detail about how um, how your hormones are um, 
needing to change for for milk production, which can be helpful um, to to be aware of. So, mm-hmm. like I'm saying, in in steps one and two of the process, the breasts begin to produce milk. Estrogen and progesterone levels must drop um, because those hormones need to be high to produce um, breast tissue, but they need to be low for that breast tissue to excrete milk. Um, Mm -hmm. So being aware that there are, those are very distinct phases. Um, Yeah. It's just like, because in pregnancy too, it's like you, during pregnancy, that's, the, that's basically the, the, the step one of our procedure is building that breast tissue, the, what would happen during pregnancy. Um, and then step two or three is going to be that phase, like once the placenta is born. Um, what happens then you have these hormone level levels drop drastically so that prolactin can increase because prolactin cannot be high while those, uh, while estrogen and progesterone are high. Um, They work uh, against each other. So it's kind of like how, um, if there's retained placenta, then a mom may not produce any milk um because it's preventing those hormone levels from dropping uh, mm-hmm. and that can also that's also plays a part in like if getting pregnant while lactating um it's like being aware of how those those hormones work sometimes if you that is how breastfeeding can be a form of birth control mm-hmm. if you're following correct protocols um because those high prolactin levels also prevent the hot um high estrogen and progesterone levels um mm-hmm. they'll they just work work against each other in that way um there yeah whenever it gets to talking about like um progesterone like um medications it points out that the progesterone creams are not recommended for um preparing your breasts to make milk because they don't yeah. provide a reliable um, source of progesterone. Um, uh-huh. I feel like that might be good information to to pass on. Um, yeah. 